So in the final part of this year's Ghosts Upon the Earth series, I want to return to talk about the biblical patriarch, Jacob. We talked last week about Jacob having what we would describe nowadays as a stressed life. He's born second in a world in which you need to be first. And Jacob became a metaphor for us at some level of what it's like to pursue something which is ultimately unattainable for you. And in this pursuit, his life becomes deeply complex. Jacob's living with these promises of God that he's gonna achieve these particular things, but his route to trying achieving them involves trying to work out many of the sort of world standards rather than just how God is asking him to process through the promise that's upon him. So we found Jacob, and this is true for most of Jacob's life in the narrative, he is on the run from his brother. Because of how he's tricked his brother out of various things, it's no longer safe for him to be, well, to be somewhere where his brother knows that he is. As a result, he finds himself with some other family members. uh, And despite being with other family members, as you read the narrative of Jacob, you realize this is probably one of the most dysfunctional families you've ever encountered because they spend most of the story tricking each other out of stuff. If, If one's not robbing something from one, the other one's robbing it from the other one. And backwards and forwards this go, it even gets to the extent that Jacob is tricked into marrying both of his uncle's daughters. Now, as theologians, we're just gonna step by the awkward conversation we can have about that and just ignore that part of the narrative and say, it was a long time ago. But Jacob finds himself at one stage in this journey, despite all of the scheming, that he probably needs to put things right with his brother. So he begins this journey of approaching his brother to put things right, and he decides that the way that he'll go about doing that is that he will send a lot of gifts to his brother. So he stacks up this voluminous amount of of animals, livestock, and various sort of wealth indicators in those days, and starts sending them down the road in stages. So the idea being that by the time the brother has had to work through all of these arriving gifts and he reaches Jacob, then his sort of mood will be a little better. So, you know, as this wealth starts coming his way, he'll think and remember, you know what, we did used to have fun times as kids. And then as more cattle pass by, and also he was good for a laugh. And also, yeah, we can be friends again, despite him stiffing me out of most everything I was supposed to inherit. As a result of this, Jacob's wealth is going on down the road. Jacob finds himself at the back of this long train of gifts on his own in Genesis chapter 32. Verse 24 picks up the story like this. And Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And you remember, Jacob means deceiver, the grasper of the heel, the one who will trick you. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means to strive. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, well, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is another one of those kind of weird stories in the Bible in which we read it and go, uh, so what now, huh? (laughs) Like, how's that story go on? Jacob finds himself in this wrestling match and it seems a little complex and we're not quite understanding how this is going on. And as, as the story is interpreted, we realize that this character that Jacob is wrestling with is is God, and and many of us can relate to wrestling with God, but it's not normally a physical all night long encounter worthy of the WWF channels. Normally it's more something that goes on in our head, which is really us just speaking to ourselves about what we're gonna talk ourselves into next. But Jacob finds himself wrestling physically with God, and the net result of this wrestle is a redefinition of his call, but also that he walks away limping. 
This final moment, we see Jacob, this man who's ran his whole life from everything, this man who's constantly been scheming and running away from his, from his life at some level. And the scene ends with him limping out of the story. We all live with stress. And we assume that the kind of fitter, happier, more productive model of our Western world is the aim that we all should be seeking after. So we put up with the stress because that's what we're all supposed to be chasing, right? And then what we start to do theologically is many of us start to assume that that's God's way too. That God is dragging you on a journey where you are more productive, more successful, happier, fitter, fitting in the standards of our world. So becoming a Christian is often a sort of journey towards just a more successful and godly version of the life our world tells us we should be living. So how do we encounter a story? And what do we do when we encounter a story like this, where the narrative says that the encounter with God sends Jacob away broken? It sends Jacob away limping. Jacob is less adequate than he was when the story started. I mean, is God okay with that? Are we okay with that? It's not the narrative we've come to expect in Western Christianity. We used to sing a song in church when I was a kid. And one of the lines of the song was, and in his presence, our problems disappear. I can only assume that the person that had wrote that song was not a Christian. <laughs> because any Christian will tell you, that hasn't been my experience. <laughs> the following of Jesus has not been a problem-free life. The encounter with God has not ironed everything out for me. And yet still we subtly believe that that is the narrative we're supposed to be living. That things get better because you know God. That things will be sorted out and everything will be plain sailing. And here we have Jacob. Jacob has been scheming his entire life. Jacob has always been trying to deal with his own sense of inadequacy. The fact that life has handed him a deal that he doesn't like, and he's trying hard to fight against that. At some level, Jacob, like many of us, is trying to prove something to someone. The question often is, and I find this when I read Jacob's story, and I find this often when I think about my own life, what is it that I'm trying to prove? And who is it that I'm trying to prove it to? So we get caught into this high stress scenario of trying to live up to a standard that many of us, if we're really honest, we're not entirely sure where this is coming from, but it's very real and we're living with its, with its pressures. We're living with it constantly drawing upon us. But now we find Jacob. We know he's got brokenness. The story's given us an insight into his psyche that this guy is having various struggles to do what he's doing. We can see that plainly worked out. But for the first time in the story, Jacob has to deal with something. His vulnerability is now physical. He's now limping. His brokenness is now public. And that exposes Jacob to something, perhaps the one thing that we all fear more than even death itself. And that's shame. We fear shame. We fear that inability to cover over our failings. We fear that inability to cover over the things that we don't want other people to know. None of us get easily through this life, but if we can try and minimize the amount of shame that we encounter, the amount of shame that we encounter from anything that's going on in our lives, and all of the things we all fear are different, but all of us have something that we really hope nobody else finds out. Brené Brown explains shame like this. Shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me, if other people know it or see it, that I, that I won't be worthy of connection? We know this feeling. At some level, our series this year is wrestling with the issue of stress, and much of this modern stress comes from our fear of shame. Perhaps you phrase the word like this, I'm not blank enough. We all have a word that we put in that blank. Rich, beautiful, smart, promoted, thin, fit, whatever it is, we have a something. A something that we know is true, that we're just not keeping a particular standard that we think we should be keeping. So what we do is we start to pretend, we lie and we stress, just hoping that we never ever reveal the vulnerability that causes us to limp. 
And that trying to keep up is killing us. That trying to keep up is deeply unhealthy because we're living out a lie. And if you think about it, then at some level, we're dying for something that we know is a lie. I encountered this story, and a few of you have sent this story across to me in the course of teaching this series of the Calgary businessman, George Gosby. George spent most of his life in Calgary, a very, very successful investment banker, a company owner, co-owner of an NHL team, economic advisor to the prime minister. And on the 12th of November last year, another victim of suicide. Being such a significant character in the Calgary business scene, this story made many of the newspapers and newsreels uh, around our city. And as I was reading the Calgary Herald's account of the story, this particular line caught my attention. From Deborah Yedlin, the reporter who was commentating. She said of George, the notion that someone who on the face of it had everything or almost everything, that they would despair to the point that they would take their own life is devastating. And I find myself thinking, devastating to whom? Devastating to us? Is it devastating to us that we might have to face the fact that the dream, the picture of success, the thing that so many of us are chasing after might not be all it's cracked up to be? That having got this success, having achieved this particular standard, having all the markers that our society would look at in someone and say, that's what success looks like. That someone might get there and realize it's not enough, that it's not what they were looking for. Maybe it's devastating because it, we really don't want to have to consider whether there's something deeply wrong with our culture. We really don't want to have ask the questions that a scenario like Georgie's death perhaps should make us ask that maybe what we're searching for isn't enough. Maybe it isn't ever going to be enough. Maybe it isn't even the right thing that we're searching for. And then this past Friday, in an interview on CBC, Georgie's wife, Karen, started to talk about George and his mental health and his alcoholism and his struggle with various pills. At one point in the interview, Karen was asked how George was able to juggle all of the challenges of his life, and yet, and this is what the interview quoted, have that public persona of so much success, not just the wealth, but actual success. To which she answered, perception was everything. He was a highly intelligent man, and he knew that if there was reason to doubt him, the success wouldn't be as easy to obtain. That was really the nature of him. He could cultivate that energy, and he was quite good at selling. Basically, he sold himself, even though his essence wasn't good. And this is a profoundly sad story for so many reasons. And it's tempting for us to try and rationalize a story like this, to try and make sense of someone's suicide. If we're honest enough to sit back and think there's more going on here than just what happens with one businessman. And we must be quick to remember that no one chooses a reaction like George did. We're often quick to forget that the decision to kill oneself only arises when somebody really does feel like they're out of choices. Suicide victims are not taking the easy way out. They're, they are taking what they perceive to be the only way out. And they often feel like they've been pushed there. Now, suicide is a complex taboo, uh, a terrifying subject to talk about. Uh, part of the reason why it's so terrifying to talk about is that we know that talking about subjects reduces the stigma and taboo. The problem is what... what the statistics tell us is that when we talk poorly about suicide, one of the net effects of talking poorly about suicide is the suicide rate increases. When a high-profile celebrity perhaps kills themselves, this way the story is reported, people that work in the field of, of helping uh, victims of suicide and, and their families notice that the suicide rate goes up. As it becomes less taboo, it seems easier. Suicide breeds. Teachers will tell you this is particularly true amongst teens that our young people are hugely affected and susceptible to the pressure of this sort of horrendous journey. 
But also it's worth us noting that suicide is particularly high amongst the successful. The more successful you are, the higher you are at risk of this. Highly successful businessmen are five times more likely to be victims of suicide than the general population. Likewise, high achieving teenagers are more susceptible than, than average achieving or low achieving teenagers. This is quickly becoming one of the biggest killers of the Western world. Now, over a century ago, Emile Durkheim noted that having aspirations that were unattainable and unsustainable actually increased the suicidal tendencies of a human. We're searching for something that's beyond us. And because it's beyond us, eventually we despair and we start to despair of life itself. Today, we know that living in high stress saps away your serotonin. And having low serotonin actually increases your likelihood to be aggressive. And for some people, that aggression is turned towards themselves. And they find themselves on a path and a journey which is suicidal. But at the same time, suicidal isn't logical. Like depression, like anxiety, it's something that happens. And, it's, and we want to rationalize it. And I'm becoming convinced that the reason we want to rationalize it is we want to find something to attach to each individual case so that we can continue living our lives as normal, not having to make changes as a result of what we're observing happening in our society. But it's hard not to see the rising statistics in the Western world and not think that maybe it's symptomatic of how we're living, of how we're choosing to go about doing our lives. Maybe our burnout and exhaustion is telling us something. Maybe our stresses and our anxieties and our depressions are reminding us that we need a willingness to be vulnerable, that we need to be brave enough sometimes to tell the truth, that we need to create spaces where it's okay to tell the truth. Because if we don't, it makes me think that we're dying of shame. We're dying because we just don't feel that we can honestly admit to the fact that we can't keep up. And despite, even after our death, the newspapers might write about how much of a success you are, which only increases our constant fear that we can't admit that this train's going too fast for us. And Jacob limped. And his limp was a constant reminder to him that his days of running were over, that his days of escaping and plotting had to end because he wasn't capable of it anymore. And maybe the limp teaches all of us that we can't keep going the way that we should keep going. Maybe burnout, exhaustion, maybe it's a way of your body telling you that you're looking for hope and salvation in the wrong places. There's a beautiful story in John chapter 20, right after Jesus' resurrection, he's appearing to his disciples and one of his disciples, infamously now Thomas, manages to not be there when Jesus appears. Thomas has that kind of luck that he just finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. So when the other disciples come to Thomas and say, Jesus has been raised from the dead, Thomas, like a good human says, that sounds highly unlikely. <laughs> but the disciples are deeply scared. Jesus has been executed as a political rebel. So they kind of wonder that maybe they're next. So they shut themselves up in a home and they're hiding out so that nobody will find them. And Thomas is there in John chapter 20 and verse 26. The text says a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Fascinating line from Jesus there. How often Jesus appears in our situations and says, peace be with you. The question as to whether we can hear that, listen to that and apply that is up for debate. But Jesus' words are always peace in the midst of the storm. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Have you ever thought about the fact that Thomas only re recognized the resurrected Jesus by his imperfections? The marks the world would call signs of failure the marks that Jesus' society would read as proof that you were destroyed, as proof that you were defeated, as proof that you had not taken victory. It was those very marks that made Thomas look at Jesus and realize that he was stood in the presence of God. My Lord and my God, says this young Jewish man. And we can be deeply uncomfortable with this 
this idea that Jesus looks so vulnerable. We want our Jesus to have these signs of strength and power. So we gravitate as Christians towards the images of Jesus which appear powerful, the images of Jesus which appear strong, often missing that Jesus rarely ever appears to us as a strong one by our world standards. We find Jesus in Revelation on a white horse looking like a warrior, and then we look closer and realize that actually he's covered in his own blood because this warrior dies for his enemies. We see the prophet proclaim, look, the lion of Judah. And when we look at the lion of Judah, whenever he appears, he is a lamb looking like he'd been slain. Jesus never appears in the way that the world sees victory. Jesus never appears like the lion. He always appears like the broken lamb. Because this is the God that Jacob met and walked away from limping. This is the God of the limp. Brennan Manning says to all of us who might listen, our huffing and puffing to impress God, our scrambling for brownie points, our thrashing about to fix ourselves while hiding our pettiness and wallowing in guilt, our nauseating to God and our flat denial of the gospel of grace. See, we want a successful Jesus. We want a Jesus that looks like the power and strength of our world. And part of the reason we want Jesus to look like that is because we want to be like that too. We want to be impressive. We want to look like we've got it all together. We want to, to achieve something that looks successful by our world's standards. But this stunning gospel is a reminder that that's not how this God works. It's not how he's wired. So perhaps for us, there's a lesson and that is we need to learn to flourish in the power of no. At the center of so much of our stress and overwhelm is that we are saying yes to so much more. We're saying yes to almost everything that comes our way. Why? Because we have this debilitating fear of missing out. There's something going on and I need to be involved in it. Imagine if that was to happen and it was awesome and I wasn't there. Nobody wants to read about that great moment on Instagram with the hashtag FOMO. What we actually want is to be part of it. And because of our fear of missing out from it, we keep driving ourselves to, to achieve more, to gain more, to be involved in more. Because it's hard for us because we've been so conditioned to believe that more is always better. So how do we learn to say no? And more importantly, perhaps, how do we learn to say no and accept that for ourselves and be okay with it? This is not some self-help sort of advice that I'm throwing out, by the way. This is not some, if you say no, you'll find success comes your way. This is not say no and achieve more. This is not say no and earn all you've ever wanted to. The message of the gospel is actually sometimes say no and you might be passed over for promotion. Say no and you might miss out. Say no and awesome things might happen while you're in bed. Say no and exciting things might happen while you're hanging out with your family. But saying no also means yes. And so often we forget that there are yeses that we are missing out on because of the yeses we're saying elsewhere. Saying no might make you present. Saying no might allow you to see the things you'd never seen before. Saying no might make you a better husband, a better partner, a better parent, a better child. Saying no might allow you to be a better friend. It might allow you to, to see what's going on around about you. My grandfather used to always say, in life you have to stop and smell the roses. Sometimes we need to just slow down because the journey has value. The journey is important. And if all we're constantly driving towards is there's something over there and I'm afraid I'm missing out on it, what might we be missing here in the present? So you've got to set boundaries for yourself. There's a word we love as modern Western people, boundaries. Everybody loves a boundary. We know where our boundaries are. We know what our standards are. We know what we're capable of and not capable of. The problem is our denial of our own self and our willingness to just ignore our boundaries. So I invite you, perhaps something you need to do is create some boundaries, say no to some stuff, and then stick to it. Don't apologize for your boundaries. Have boundaries. Live by them and let them save your life. You know, turn your phone off once in a while and then don't apologize to anyone for turning your phone off. Be okay with that. 
Be okay with missing out on some notifications on your social media feed. Be okay with not answering that email because by you not being okay with that, perhaps you're missing out on being okay with the people that are around you, with the life that's happening about you, with what you're missing on. So when we start limping, you see, it's very hard for us not to believe that we are missing out. And that is stressful. It's stressful feeling like somebody's getting promoted faster than you. It's stressful thinking that somebody's earning more money than you. It's stressful all these things that are going on. So like Jacob, our temptation is to wrestle and scheme and try our hardest to avoid the deep truth that God is in our brokenness. God is in our inability. God is with us while we're limping. He is the God of the fatherless and the widow, remember. He's not the God of the self-made success story. He's the God of the limp. The question for us is, can we handle the shame of stepping off that train, of stepping off this journey that is apparently killing us to try and achieve something more? Can we live where we are? The apostle Paul discovered that God's strength worked best in our weaknesses. Jesus' victory came in the scars of crucifixion and Jacob limped. Despite this, however, Jacob was highly resistant to the lesson that God was trying to teach him. It's amazing how often in our lives that if we experience bad things, you would assume that we would be the type of people who would ensure that that didn't happen to others. And yet strangely, what we notice in humans is our own hurts we pass on. So Jacob finds himself married to two sisters. One of these sisters was the one he wanted to get married to. The other one was a sister he was tricked into marrying because of her father. Genesis 29 picks the story up like this. And Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Like what had Leah done wrong? The answer is nothing. She just happened to be involved in a trick played between her father and Jacob. And as a result of something completely out of her control, she finds herself in a life in which the biblical description of her situation is that she was hated. But this was her life. And Jacob allowed her to live that life. Despite constantly living a life of inferiority, he was unable to stop himself doing the very same thing to one of his wives. And she lives with this inferiority. We don't know much about Leah, but we can see this sense of inferiority that's wrestling through her life. Her first son that's born to her, his name that is given to him, as they did in those days, they give meaningful names. She called her first son Reuben, which means misery, because the Lord has seen my misery. Her second son she called Simeon, because she said, the Lord has seen and heard that I am unloved. And her third son she called Levi, which means perhaps now my husband will be attached to me. Deeply painful insights into this woman's life, into the scenario that she was living in. She was unloved, she was hated, and we see this working through in even how she names her children. Perhaps, I hope, maybe this will be the thing that puts my life back to where I want it to be. The hope and the stress the belief that better is achievable and sustainable starts to rot us if we're not careful. But then something happens. The Bible doesn't give us any insight into what it is. We can assume, we can make up the story, that might be dangerous, but let us just simply observe that she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. And so she called him Judah which means praise. There's something beautiful about realizing that our hearts yearn for something that the standards of our society can't achieve and they cannot satisfy. This time I will praise the Lord. I can hope that my situation is different. I can hope that my misery is changed. I can hope that everything will be put back together again. But then Leah, maybe she realizes that that's not where her answers are gonna come from. Maybe Leah realizes that just trying harder, just hoping that things will get better, 
is not actually where the satisfactions of our lives are found. And I find myself wondering as I read this broken story, what was it that called Leah to realize I'm looking in the wrong places? I'm stressing towards the wrong things. What I need to do is turn my heart to God. See, because the God of the limp, the God of our brokenness is near to us. But we have to stop sometimes. We have to say no to other things. We have to realize that the stresses are dangerous. But we also have to realize that to rest in his peace, we need to face the shame of admitting that we can't keep up. Maybe we need to admit that we're broken and that's okay. We said it last year in this series and I think it's important that we confess it again. Part of the economy of God is to realize that it's okay to not be okay. To admit to that, to identify that and to stop trying to live as though that's not the case. I wanna invite you this morning at the end of our series into a moment of quiet reflection on this series. Perhaps on your stresses and your burnout and your exhaustion. So I'm gonna invite you just to take a moment, a minute of silence. I'm gonna put three questions up on the screen. These questions might for you, be for you to re reflect on right now. There might be something that you want to reflect on in the future and just take note of them for now. But I invite you, let's all be quiet. Let's be silent together and just reflect on these. Perhaps you, like me, find silence kind of uncomfortable. We're so used to having noise going on in our lives. We say be silent, we expect some music to play in the background, something else to happen. And as we become silent, perhaps saying no to the noise, it's amazing how your ears start to adjust. You start to hear things in the room that you hadn't previously noticed. You start to be aware of things. You start to become aware of yourself. Many people say when they sit in a large room silently, the need to sneeze starts to overwhelm them. <laughs> the need to cough starts to build up inside. The uncomfortable sense to deal with the uncomfort of the silence. And maybe that says something about the pace of our lives, the, the pace of, of how things are that we experience so little silence. So these questions, perhaps about the first question, you might want to take some time, having answered it, to ask the question, why? Why is it that you feel that way? And why is it that you would want to respond the way that you do? The second question, I was almost tempted to ask, what are you able to do about it? But I think a better question for us in our society today is to say, what are you willing to do? Because we know that we are able to do a lot about it. The question is, do we want to? Do we actually want to make any changes? And that might require us to search our soul a little bit about what is important and valuable to us. Let me say this, rest is very countercultural. It sounds so simple and straightforward just to say rest, but rest is so hard to do. Have you ever tried to take a day off? I mean like a real day off, not a day where you say, and now the garage, but a day off, a day where you produce nothing. It's profoundly important for God to offer Sabbath to the Israelites, a people who had been required to work every day of their life were now told you can produce nothing for a day and still be valuable. So much of our value and our sense of, you know, kind of success is built by our ability to produce. And a day of rest 
The holiness of day of arrest is to remind you, not God, but to remind you that you can produce absolutely nothing and still be as absolutely loved by God as you are on the days when you produce. So do some simple stuff. Switch off your phone or your email. Practice saying no. Just get away. Do something that involves doing nothing. So all of these questions require some vulnerability for us. And vulnerability is necessary to bring about change. Vulnerability is not weakness, it's strength. The death of Jesus on a cross surely tells us that. And God works through the vulnerable. It fascinates me that Rachel was the mother of Joseph, the famous Israelite who, who did so much for Israel. But Jesus who also tracks his lineage back to Jacob. Jesus, perhaps surprisingly, or if you know him, perhaps unsurprisingly, Jesus is the great, 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 whatever grandson of Leah, who Jacob hated. Because God is always on the side of those of us with a limp. God is always with us when we face our shame and we touch the scars and decide to praise him anyway. Maybe when we do that, we'll find the courage to live in the peace that God offers us. Let us pray. And let me pray a psalm over you this morning. You know this psalm. It's highly familiar, but I ask you just to listen to it again rather than just remember it. The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.